In this lecture segment, we are picking up where our story left off in the late medieval period, setting up the foundation for developments in art in Italy during the Renaissance. We will focus on a sculpture, altarpieces, and a fresco that show the diversity of style and movement towards naturalism at this time. The Italian Renaissance is a period from the 14th to 16th centuries that is usually seen as a high point for artistic creation in Europe. Much of the art we look at later on will refer to the art of this period, whether in embracing it or in rejecting it. The term Renaissance means rebirth, and what is typically thought of as being reborn during this period is classical style, inherited from Greek and Roman art and architecture. And while it is true that some Renaissance art, especially early 16th century examples, will draw on classical style, much of Renaissance art will not. Instead of thinking of the Renaissance as a rebirth of all things classical, it is better to think of it as a flourishing of the arts and intellectual life during the period. The skewed perception in art historical scholarship and in popular culture that the Renaissance is all about a rebirth of classicism has an origin, and it's this guy, Giorgio Vasari. He was a 16th century painter, critic, and writer who fostered the idea that artists created a Renaissance by looking to classical style and saved art from looking medieval and Byzantine. The term he uses is renacita, meaning rebirth or revival. He will champion the contributions of hand-selected artists, most of whom are from his hometown of Florence, in his text that we usually nickname The Lives, gauging their contributions to the trajectory of Renaissance art that leads to the perfection he finds in the art of Michelangelo in the 16th century. He encourages thinking of artists as geniuses, which is a different way of thinking about an artist than we've seen before. In medieval art, we were looking at works by anonymous craftsmen, but in the Renaissance, we're looking at works by specific people, individual artists who receive notoriety in their lifetimes for their work. We will build our story of the art of the Italian Renaissance gradually in these lectures, and we'll begin in the late medieval period with works of art that show us the diversity of style at this time. We'll start in the late 13th century, which is still part of the Gothic period, but we're heading to Italy. Italy at this point is not Italy. Italy was not formed as a nation until the 19th century. It's a collection of city-states that can be each other's best friends or enemies, and the papal territories, or the lands of the Pope, the leaders of the Catholic Church, which they control. Each city-state has its own flavor, its own food, government, and artistic traditions. And this period in the late 1200s into the 14th century is a time of economic prosperity, which brings a larger population and thus a need for building projects and the embellishment of those new structures with art. We're starting off in Pisa at the same complex where the famous Leaning Tower is. It is actually a bell tower called a Campanile. Pisa is part of the Republic of Florence, a powerful city-state at this time. As was typical for Italian cities, Pisa has at its heart a cathedral complex with a cathedral, a campanile, and a baptistry. We come here in the 1260s, a time of relative prosperity for Pisa, which allowed the archbishop to commission a special work of art for the baptistry. It is by Nicola Pisano, a young artist who eventually settled in Pisa, thus earning his last name. His first known work of art was for a marble pulpit where a clergyman could stand to speak. Marble was very expensive, so this was a prestigious and elite commission. You can see the pulpit at the baptistry, and we are looking at one of the carved relief panels Nicola made. This panel shows the Annunciation, when Gabriel let Mary know that she was going to bear the Christ child, the Nativity, or the birth of Christ, and the Adoration of the Shepherds, when they come to pay homage to Christ after his birth, with all three scenes in one panel. As we've seen, medieval art was typically concerned with making stories readable and understandable for an audience, which this is. Our concern here is especially on the style he is using. The figure of Mary, for example, resembles Roman art in the face, and the drapery does show the underlying form of the body across the chest. Even within a couple of centuries, the first art historian, Giorgio Vasari, argues that Nicola's work resembles Roman sculpture in its imitation of a classical manner. He is certainly looking to classical precedents, which he would have known as part of the cathedral complex at Pisa is a cemetery called the Campo Santo, where carved Roman sarcophagi could be found in significant numbers. So there's a direct precedent which allowed the archbishop to commission a special work of art for the baptistry. It is by Nicola Pisano, a young artist who eventually settled in Pisa, thus earning his last name. His first known commission was for a marble pulpit where a clergyman could stand to speak. 
Marble was very expensive, so this was a prestigious commission. You can see the pulpit at the baptistry. We are looking at one of the carved relief panels Nicola made. This panel shows the Annunciation, where Gabriel let Mary know she was going to bear the Christ child, the Nativity, or the birth of Christ, and the adoration of the shepherds when they come to pay homage to Christ after his birth, with all three scenes in one panel. As we've seen, medieval art was typically concerned with making stories readable and understandable for an audience, which this is. Our concern here is especially on the style he is using. The figure of Mary, for example, resembles Roman art in the face, and the drapery does show the underlying form of the body across the chest. Even within a couple of centuries, the first art historian, Vasari, argues that Nicola's work resembles Roman sculpture in its imitation of the classical manner. He is certainly looking to classical precedents, which he would have known as part of the cathedral complex at Pisa, is a cemetery called the Campo Santo, where carved Roman sarcophagi could be found in significant numbers. So there is a direct classical precedent for the Al Antica, or like the antique style, he uses. But his style is multifaceted. He also uses what is called the Italo-Byzantine style, art made on the Italian peninsula with a Byzantine flavor. Check out the crisp folds in the drapery, and how the patterning of the drapery does not fully reveal the body. So even though Nicola will be championed as the best sculptor of his day, according to Fasari, because he looked back to classical art, he actually used a blend of styles and carefully selected a style for each commission he received. Let's go to Florence and look at an example of the Italo-Byzantine style in the late Gothic period in Italy. This is by the artist Cimabue, a Florentine painter who Vasari says trained as a child with artists from the Byzantine Empire who were working at a monastery in Florence. This is an altarpiece, so a painting made to be the backdrop for the Eucharist in a church. This one was commissioned to be placed at the high altar of a church in Florence. It is a large painting on panel, so tempera paint is applied to carefully prepared wood panel made of multiple pieces of wood joined together. The artist used gilding, applying gold leaf or thin layers of gold to the panel, both in large areas and along the edges of garments, to create a rich object that would have sparkled in the candlelit church, especially at the high altar where the miracle of the Eucharist took place. The currency in Florence at this time was the florin, and from a single gold florin, a hundred sheets of gold leaf could be pounded out, so it was precious and very fine. We see an iconography we've seen before, the virgin and child enthroned, as Mary gestures to her son, telling us he is the way to salvation. They are presented in an iconic way, frontal, elongated bodies and these spidery Byzantine hands. We see the scene from multiple points of view, from up here and down below, there is no one vantage point being used for the viewer, and this distances the viewer from the image. The emphasis here is on making an otherworldly depiction of the Virgin that resembles what we saw in Byzantine art. So around 1300, we have a diversity of styles in medieval Italy, in particular the Florentine Republic. We have Niccolò Pisano looking back to the Roman visual traditions of Pisa, and we have Cimabue in Florence looking th to the Italo-Byzantine tradition that was prevalent. The prevailing style begins to shift around 1300 with the contributions of Giotto, a Florentine artist Vasari champions as a savior of art. Giotto, perhaps a student of Cimabue, brings a new degree of naturalism to art at this time and place. He receives a commission from a religious order to create an altarpiece for their church in Florence. Same subject as the Cimabue, same function but with some differences. Giotto makes a rich image suitable for a high altar, but he does not use as much mordant gilding or gilding along the edges of the cloth. Instead, he uses the cloth to create a greater, to a greater degree to reveal the body at the knees and the chest, instead of Cimabue's use of cloth as a pattern for obscuring the body. The face of the Virgin is softer, with greater modeling than the flatter, more plainer face of Cimabue's. And Giotto creates a viewpoint for the audience, a single place from which to view the altarpiece, down here, as if the viewer looks up to the scene, but is also given a path to approach the Virgin to the middle and up, instead of the removed Virgin who is physically inaccessible for the viewer. The holy figures in Giotto's occupy space more convincingly, in comparison to the stacked floating figures of Cimabue. Giotto is employing a higher degree of naturalism than Cimabue was, and he is moving away from the Italo-Byzantine style. 
One last example by Giotto shows this move towards naturalism at the beginning of the 14th century. In Padua, Giotto received a commission to paint frescoes in a chapel owned by a wealthy, wealthy banking family, the Scroveni family. You see the chapel here. Enrico Scroveni was trying to increase the chances of salvation for his father, who was a banker, and thus was guilty of usury or charging interest on loans, a damnable offense. It's a good commission for the young Giotto, and gives him the opportunity to experiment with how he tells stories, using a relatively inexpensive medium, fresco, just paint on wet plaster. We see here the whole chapel space with the cycle of frescoes he paints. We will look at just one, the Lamentation. In the Lamentation, we see the basic elements essential to this narrative. The deceased Christ, with followers, including apostles and his mother, Mary. Figures are carefully modeled on the same scale and relatively naturalistic. Drapery shows the body underneath and is not patterned. The color palette is harmonious and consistent. Giotto constructs the scene to focus our attention on the essential moment of mourning. The landscape element directs us down to Mary and Christ. He leaves us as a, sp a space as a viewer to join the circle and mourn with them, even having a figure with her back to us to make space for us to join. He uses clear expressions to communicate their emotions to us, the many tearful faces and the gesture of John here, and the mourning Mary here. Giotto boils the story down to its nuts and bolts in a pretty naturalistic scene that does not seem to be otherworldly. We have a blue sky and elements of nature that ground the image and bring it into our world. And within a few years after Giotto emerges on the art scene in Florence, tastes shift from the Italo-Byzantine to a more naturalistic approach. But Giotto is not the only artist moving towards naturalism. Even though Vasari wants us to believe that Giotto was the lone savior of painting, it was more about a general shift in preferences that helps to place this more naturalistic approach as a portion of the story of the early Renaissance.